Make your jokes now. We got two Fords with the hoods up. Uh, this one, I just replaced the engine with a reman, so I'm just getting that buttoned up. It runs awesome now. This one has nothing wrong with it. I just got it on a battery tender and the hood's up because the battery tender's there. You didn't click this video to find out about that stuff, though. You clicked this because I promised I would explain to you why cars get that alternator noise when you install an aftermarket amplifier sometime because it's important to know why it happens so you know how to fix it and you don't have to buy anything to fix it. it it's way easier than you think. I don't know why everyone overthinks this. The problem for me is that I don't actually have that problem because I it's a problem I solved decades ago and I, it just doesn't happen to me. So let's go inside and I'll show you why it happens. You'll understand it and then you'll know how to fix it and then you'll never have that problem again. All right, visual aids. Uh, I've got this old radio that came out of my project truck. It doesn't work, but that's okay. We don't need it to work. I've got a car audio amplifier. I've got a sweet open sign. That's not part of this, it's just there. Uh, as for my qualifications, I've been in the electronics manufacturing and engineering industry for a quarter century at this point. Uh, my boss charges an obscene amount of money for an hour of my time. So uh, this is something I got a decent handle on. And the thing that I find really weird about this particular problem, the whole ground loop thing is that it's in the name. It's literally in the name. And yet I've looked all over YouTube for another video that explains this solution. And there's just not one, which is insane because like this is the most obvious, easy solution that everyone should have figured out decades ago and it shouldn't be a thing. Now, I get why some companies don't wanna solve this problem the easy way because they wanna sell you a product. I mean, that, that's pretty obvious, right? Capitalism, they want to sell you a product. So if you can fix this problem without buying a product, then they don't win anything out of that. So I'm going to tell you how to fix this problem without a product. Uh, I guess a piece of wire is a product, but that, that, aside from that. So the deal with ground loop interference or ground loop noise is that we're specifically going to be talking about the noise you get when you hook up a aftermarket radio using RCAs to an aftermarket amplifier in a car. And you get a noise that sounds kind of like high pitch whistling that changes when you rev the engine, that kind of stuff. This can also creep in on if you're using a factory radio and you're using speaker level inputs. It can still happen, but it's less likely to happen. This is cheap insurance that you should do on every amplifier install. Just do it. You'll be glad you did. So uh, first, you should probably understand why this works and why you get that noise. And then once you understand how and why you get the noise in the first place, then the solution is obvious. Again, I don't know why I have to make this video. Anyway, so uh, first thing, if you're old, you probably remember on old television sets when you're hooking up through a Nintendo, around the back there was a loop antenna for UHF. Uh, this is a loop. And the way a loop antenna works is uh, that you get radio waves, they're electromagnetic interference that is in the air, deliberately put there, of course, in the case of TV or radio. And when it hits an appropriately sized like geometrically appropriately sized antenna, it excites it enough that there is a voltage differential between these two ends of it. So you've got your TV receiver in between these things, electrically, I mean, obviously it's gonna be inside the TV, but electrically between these two ends, and it picks up the difference between the two ends because this is geometrically the right size to pick up a certain bandwidth of radio waves. Interesting thing about an antenna is, even though this is an antenna right here, this is not an antenna because as soon as I short circuit it, it no longer could be an antenna. It's only an antenna when there is an open circuit or a appropriate resistance and capacitance at the end of it. So the way that you solve <laughs> solve an antenna is you just make it not an antenna and then it's not an antenna anymore. Problem solved. How does that relate to ground loops in a car? Well, it's a, a loop, right? You follow me here? It's a loop, it's an antenna. So what's going on is that, uh, we'll put this off to the side here. Uh, you've got your RCA cables that you're plugging into your head unit, and you've got your RCA cables that you're plugging into your amplifier, right? And that's how it sends the signal between two things. The thing with an RCA cable is the tip is the positive side of it. That's the positive side of the signal itself. But every positive side needs a negative side because that's how a circuit works. Like a circle, a circuit has to go full loop. So you've got your positive side on this end, and the you know, digital to analog converter and all that kind of stuff is crapping out a signal on that. And then it references that against a ground. That common ground is the ring terminal. These two, the, the ring terminal is gonna be exactly the same signal. They're gonna be shorted to each other internally in there. And on either end, there's going to be a ground reference that those pick up. So on this one here, there's a ground reference that should be chassis ground, but it isn't quite. It's always gonna be semi-floating. On this end here, it's either going to be semi-floating 
or it's going to be fully floating. Like in the case of an amplifier that has RCA inputs that you can also put speaker level into the same RCA inputs, those are going to be balanced differentials. So they're going to be mostly fully floating, mostly. Uh, they're going to be mostly floating. And so if you have a difference between the ground reference here and what it's picking up and acting like is a ground reference here, then what you have is an antenna. The reason for that is because you have a different ground plane here. This is connected to the chassis of the car somewhere up front where it might be like, you know, just the underneath the dashboard kind of framework. And it's just that which has maybe some galvanization on it, which is not quite as conductive as steel is. And maybe there's a bit of rust, you know, maybe there's an air gap, whatever. And then in the back, you've got your amplifier hooked up to a terminal somewhere in the back. that's just like on the body somewhere. There's always going to be some a tiny difference between those two grounds. They're not going to have an absolute zero ohms at every frequency because we're talking impedance here, not just resistance. There's going to be some difference between that ground plane. So if this is semi-floating and this is fully floating, or if this is semi-floating and this is semi-floating, or worst case scenario, if they're both not at all floating, that, that opens up a whole different Pandora's box. These things are going to have slightly different ground planes from each other, and that's going to make this whole arrangement here into a loop antenna. That's your ground loop. That's why it's called a ground loop. So uh, companies will try to sell you something called a ground loop isolator. And what that does is it uses a couple of transformers and a couple of capacitors sometimes in a little box that plugs in between the RCA inputs of your amplifier and the RCA outputs of your head unit. That little box just has a couple of transformers. The transformers themselves are like coils of wire right next to each other that don't actually touch, but their magnetic field that they create is shared among the two of them. And that allows it to pass a signal through without really being an antenna, because what you've done in that case is you've taken this antenna and you've like clipped it. You've just, you've cut it into two pieces. Uh, kind of works, kind of. Uh, two problems with that. It only clips it for a certain bandwidth, uh, for a certain audio band. And the other part is that a transformer is an inductor. Uh, a transformer is something that creates a magnetic field and magnetic fields don't travel infinitely fast, right? They travel at the speed of light, which is not infinity. It's, it's a amount of time that it takes for it to travel a distance. And so since you have a magnetic field that's being created and destroyed and created and destroyed in that coil, there is some duration of time when it gets built up and some duration of time that it collapses which means that it introduces distortion in your audio. It makes a phase shift and it introduces kind of a smearing in your high frequencies. Now that's something that you may not necessarily hear if you're like listening to just crappy MP3s and you're blasting them and all you want to hear is beats and stuff like that. But if you want to really listen to like the air, like if you've ever had that experience where you, know, you can kind of close your eyes and almost imagine the, the room that the singer is in or something like that, I'm not even talking about weird wanky audiophile stuff. I just mean like if you've ever listened to a really good recording and you're like, I can kind of hear the room, you know, that's the type of stuff that you lose if you're using an inductive coupling, like magnet, you know, like a transformer isolator. And so you lose that. The other thing is since they are an inductor, you also lose some high frequency content just in general, as in it gets attenuated, it gets quieter. And you also lose a bit of very low frequency content because of something called saturation. So it makes the sound worse. Like those things inherently introduce noise and inherently introduce distortion. They also kind of filter out other types of noise. So there's kind of a benefit. Sometimes you get very slightly better signal to noise ratio, but at what cost? So you generally want to avoid sticking one of those things in if you can avoid it. But of course, companies like selling you that because if they get you for 25 bucks a pop, cool, 25 bucks in their pocket out of yours. So here's how you solve the problem without introducing any of that bullshit. So uh, you've got your RCA cables and you're connecting them both ends just like you normally would, right? And you've also got your little blue wire that's on every aftermarket head unit that connects to the remote turn-on lead on your amplifier. So uh, somewhere around here, I have a piece of wire that I was totally going to use for this. So what I've, what I've got here is a piece of speaker wire, just regular speaker wire. And it's kind of important that this is relatively heavy gauge. So when you're connecting up your blue remote turn-on lead and you've got your remote turn-on terminal there, that doesn't really require much current. Like you could use a thread, like you could use a really, really tiny piece of wire for that. So typically you're gonna use something like 18 gauge or 22 gauge or whatever for that, but don't. Get yourself a piece of speaker wire, something heavy like 12 or 14 gauge. Run your speaker wire 
between the, the blue terminal, it's okay if it's the color red, the electrons don't care what color the insulation is. Take that, run it to your remote turn on lead, the same way that you normally would, right? Instead of using your tiny little blue wire, use a heavy gauge red wire. And here's the important part. You've also got that second conductor, heavy gauge black wire. You're gonna take this second conductor, the heavy gauge black wire, and you're gonna connect that to the ground terminal of your amplifier. Now you're still gonna hook up the ground terminal to a local ground, like something heavy gauge that can handle the amount of power that this thing's drawing. But you're gonna take your 12 or 14 gauge speaker wire ground and you're going to run that up and you're going to tie that into the ground wire of your head unit. I know I'm just twisting these together. Never install that way. That's just what I have here. So you're going to take your ground cable and connect it to the ground terminal of your head unit. This is still going to get a local ground. This is still going to connect to whatever the local ground is that you would have connected it to anyways. You're just introducing this one in. It's got a little three-way action there. So this is going to go over to the ground terminal of that. This is gonna to go to your local heavy gauge ground to power the amplifier. This is gonna to go to your local relatively heavy gauge ground to connect this so that it'll turn on. You just have this additional ground right here. And the other part of this that's relatively important is you're gonna run this along with your RCAs. This part's slightly less important, but it's still a really good idea to do. And the reason for that is when you've got an antenna the geometry of the antenna, like the reason it is a certain size, the reason it's not tiny or huge, the reason it's a certain size is because the size that it is determines what frequencies are able to interact with it. Like the circumference of this is what determines how large of a wavelength it's able to handle. So for example, this thing's like, I don't know, two and a half or three feet wide, then that means it's going to be able to pick up a wavelength that's two and a half to three feet in length in air. So if you take one of these things here and you squish it down so it's like super skinny and narrow, you've just excluded a lot of frequencies. You've made it so it only responds to much higher frequencies and not lower frequencies because the wavelength that it responds to has to be able to magnetically interact with it in a much smaller little thing there. So what you do is you take your RCAs and your heavy gauge ground cable or your, you know, like I said, 12 or 14 gauge, and you run them close to each other so that they form the smallest possible cross section. That excludes low frequencies from this and also because of the fact that now you've got the same ground plane between this and that they're going to be in lockstep you're going to have exactly the same ground plane and that means you're not going to have that alternator whine so hopefully that all made sense i hope i did a good enough job explaining it to you this is cheap insurance you just get an extra piece of speaker wire and when you're installing your head unit and your amplifier you're already running these wires you're already running the rcas you're already running the remote turn on this is zero extra work. You're just introducing another conductor into the process and that conductor is gonna make sure that the ground plane on both of these is in lockstep and then you don't get the noise.